Thank you, Pastor Kurt. Isn't it fun to sing and just sing praises to the Lord? Wonderful. Thank you for singing this morning and worshiping. I want to just say a quick thing. Uh, on Friday night, we had, uh, um, our church had our children's zone outreach, uh, which went wonderfully. Uh, we had, there, there was over 130 young people in the building, and the gospel was clearly presented to them, and also got a chance to uh, meet a lot of new people, uh, meet, uh, meet a lot of new parents, and it was just a wonderful, wonderful time. And I just want to say uh, thank you for praying, uh, thank you for praying for the Lord to work, and um, thank you for those of you who were involved and for working so hard uh, to make it such a great success. And so thank you very, very, very much. And if you want to know more about that, uh, you can uh, talk to me or talk to someone who was there and be glad to uh, talk more about that exciting time. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, if you're not there already, to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, or your phone or your tablet or whatever it is you have. And we're going to begin reading in verse number 12 this morning. And right before, right before we dive in, I would just like to pray one last time and just ask the Lord to bless our time in the Word. So would you pray with me? Father, we come before you. I just want to ask one last time that as we look at your Word this morning, that you would indeed speak to our hearts through it. And that uh, you, as, as your Word said, that your Word would reach and divide into our hearts and Convict where we need convicted, encourage where we need encouraged, and that you would just work and help us to become more like you today. And Father, we ask all of these things in your name. Amen. I have a question for us this morning. How much time did you spend with God this week, this past week? How much time did you spend with God? In this book right here. Getting to know Him. Getting to know who He is. Learning the kind of person, learning more fully the kind of person that God wants us to be. How much time did you spend with God? This is where it is. This is where we know God. This place and nowhere else. The word is so important. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the, son of God, or, or no, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. One more, Psalm 119 verse 9, we read it this morning, says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your, what? Word. By guarding it according to your word. How much time do we spend with our God? Getting to know him. And that word, and, um, and the word uh, to know is used by Peter here in the beginning of this book in chapter 1. Right there uh, in the first couple of verses. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And that word knowledge there, it's the, here Peter uses the word epignosis, that Greek word, which, which yes, it means to know him as Savior. But it also carries the idea of to know him past salvation, to know him beyond salvation. To really come to an understanding, which will take all of our lives, by the way, and will probably take all of eternity with us, with him in heaven, to really gain that full knowledge of God. But that's the idea. Are we coming to know our God? How much time do, do we spend getting to know our God from week to week, day to day? Some of you, some of us, some of you, are really good at this. Some of you spend a lot of time with God. There's others that I think would have to say that you keep saying, I'll get around to it. I'm busy, I'll get around to it. I promise I'm gonna get around to it. Well, it's time to get around to it. 
It's time to get around to it. Because it is only through knowing God through his word that we are that we are then able to do what, what the Apostle Peter is going to challenge all of us to do today. In this passage, verses 12 through 15, which we'll look at here in just a minute, it is only as we know our God that we are able to come up to this challenge that the Apostle Peter gives to us, that we are able to take on the burden that the Apostle Peter took on himself. It's only through knowing Him, and it's simply this, it's only through knowing Him that we can then speak the truth into other people's lives. Why do we not speak the truth more into other people's lives, we can ask? Is it because we don't know a lot of the truth ourselves? Because we find that we are not in here the way we need to be, getting to know Him in His Word. The question is this this morning. This is, kind of the, they, uh, this, uh, this is kind of the question we're going to keep coming back to over and over this morning. Here's the question. Do people around you and do people around me know God better, know God more fully because I am there or because you are there? Grandparents, do your grandchildren know God a little bit better and, and have a, a, a little bit fuller understanding of who God is and understand just a wee little bit better the kind of person that God wants them to grow up to be? Do they have a knowledge of that a little bit more because you're in their life and because you're speaking that truth to them? Parents, Parents, do our children know God a little bit better? Do they understand who God is just a little bit better? Do they understand the kind of people that God wants them to grow up to be? Do they understand that? Do they know God just a wee wee little bit better because we are there? Or does it really not matter if we're there? Would we have to, like, like as we ask ourselves these questions this morning, would we have to say, boy, you know what? I'm not sure that it really matters if I'm there or not right now. I don't think they know God any better than, it, it, than when I'm there or when I'm not there. As we are with people, as, as we're with our brothers and sisters, and this goes for more than just teenagers and young people, by the way. Do my brothers, I got three of them, do my brothers know God a little bit better because God has placed me in their life? Do I know God a little bit better because God has placed them in my life? And we speak the truth to one another and we encourage each other in the truth of God's word. Because we are in God's word, we are coming to know God ourselves, and we cannot help but just, uh, but, uh, but just let it come out of our hearts. These are the questions this morning. And, I, and, and by the way, I want to be very, very careful here to say um, that, that uh, not in a self-righteous way either. Um, not, uh, not, not in, you know, I'm, not, not in, you know, I'm kind of going to stand over you, 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 you know, and just... Proclaim the truth to you and you better sit down and listen to what I have to say kind of a thing. Um, no, but just as we live our lives, as we are just going through our day-to-day -day routines as parents, as children, as teenagers, as, as, as moms and dads and as grandparents. As we're going through our daily lives, are we spending time with God, getting to know Him way past salvation Knowing who our God is, understanding who our God is, knowing Him, developing our relationships with Him, becoming the people that God wants us to be, and from that, we can speak into other people's lives just because it's overflowing out of our hearts. Do people know God better because we are in their life? That's the question. I've entitled this message this morning, Peter's Parting Gift. Peter's Parting Gift. As, as we read the, as, as uh, uh, George read the passage a little bit earlier, 
Um, you, you've probably already seen. What, uh, Peter's message here is that he's about to die. He knows it. Um, the time is growing short for him. And he knows that what God revealed to him, I believe it was back in John chapter 21, where, God, uh, where, where, where Jesus left him know that he was going to die for the cause of Christ. Peter somehow knows that this is about ready to take place. And as he knows this time's coming near, he says, I have one more gift that I want to give. I have one more thing that I want to do and that I want to continue to do. This is Peter's parting gift, okay? And I'm going to tell you what it is, okay? This is, the, 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 this is message spoiler alert right here, okay? Um, spoiler alert, here we go. Or, or I'm going to say this and I'm going to get down and we're going to be all done for the day, okay? Um, his message is this, that as I come to the end of my life, there's one more thing that I will not stop doing. I, I, I will continue to give this gift to people until the day I die. I will never stop doing this. And it's simply this. And we're going to see as we read the passage today exactly what he's saying here. What he's saying is this. I will forever, I will never stop teaching who God is. As I have come to know, as I have come to know my God through his word. And in Peter's case, as he walked with Jesus himself. As I know him, I will never stop teaching who he is so that other people can also know him, and I will never stop encouraging people to walk with him and be obedient to him. I will never stop doing this. This is my parting gift to everybody. That when I die, here is my total view, that when I die, or, or actually, I like the way Peter says it a little bit better here than, than when I die. Down in verse number 15, he says, my departure. Because he's really not going to die, right? He's going to die, but he's really just departing from one place to the next, okay? But he says, when I depart, I want to leave behind me people who know God and who obey God. I want to leave behind me people who know God and who obey God, and they are in that place largely because God has used me as a tool in their life to speak into their life. That's what I want to leave behind. That's my whole goal. This is my parting gift to you. As I am about ready to depart and to go away and, and, and my time of work on this earth is going to be over, I will not be able to, to influence people anymore. This is the last thing that I want to do with the final days of my life. I will never stop doing this. As I was studying this this week, a song came to my mind. Some of you may have heard it. I believe it's an older song. Um, it's called The Greatest Gift by Stephen Annie Chapman. How many, of you have heard, how many of you have heard that song before? Several of you, okay? So you're a little bit familiar with it. But it talks about, the, the, the reason I thought of it is uh, it talks about the same kind of relationship. Um, of, but it talks about this kind of a relationship with parents towards their children. Um, and I'm just going to, for effect, I'm just going to sing for you the second verse. Um, of this song. It goes like this. Mm, okay, got it. Someday the house will crumble. Time will turn the land to dust. And when all accounts are empty, where will you invest their trust? But if the riches that you give them is the wisdom of his ways then the wealth you leave your children will last through all their days and i'm going to stop there some of you are like thank you very much <laughs> the first part of that song it talks about how whenever we like as parents whenever we depart whenever we die we can leave them earthly things uh, we can leave our children, I believe the song talks about we can leave them houses, uh, we can leave them money, we can leave our children land, property, and there's nothing wrong with those things, by the way. In fact, let me just say this for the record, I hope, I really do, I hope that God allows me to leave those kinds of things for my children, uh, things that they can use, um, things that they can get along better in life with, because I've, I've had a chance to provide them, but the song's main 
objective is communicating this message that yes, we can leave those things for our children, but they are not the greatest gift. They are not the greatest gift that we can leave. The greatest gift that we can leave is the knowledge of God as we have spoken it into our children's lives. One day I'm going to be gone and my kids won't have me anymore. And this is the message of Peter, that I am soon going to be gone and you're not going to have me. Not that you need me, not that anybody needs anybody, I guess, but I'm going to be gone and I'm going to have no more chance to talk or to teach or to do anything. And this is the very last thing that I want to do. I want to use the final days of my life to continue to teach who God is that other people can know Him on a deep level because of my influence, and I also want to encourage people to continue to live in an obedient way towards the Lord. It's my parting gift. These are the people that I want to leave behind whenever I depart and move on. Do we think this way? Do we think this way? Let me be completely honest with you. More often times than not, I do not think this way. That my main objective would be to leave people behind. Who, who, what, what do I want to leave behind whenever I'm not here? Do I want to leave things? Or do I want to leave people who I have touched with the knowledge of God? That they too will walk with Him when I'm away. Let's look at point number one. Let's look at Paul's gift here. Point number one today, Paul's gift. Look with me in verse number 12. The Bible says, Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. Now, before we look at these qualities that, 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 uh, that the Apostle Peter is going to, has has already reminded his readers about, I just wanted to say, I get a real kick out of that last uh, phrase right there, Um, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. Let me ask this, has anyone, has anyone ever come up to you and uh, they're about ready to remind you of something that you already know? Does that happen occasionally? You already know this, but people are going to come up and remind you of this and they start off like this, okay? It's a real humble way to start. Um, They come up and they say, now listen, um, I know that you already know this, okay? I'm not trying to tell you something that you don't already know, okay? Um, Has anyone ever started it off like that? Um, Basically, basically, I care about your feelings. I don't want you to think that I think you're stupid or unlearned or uneducated or anything like this. I understand that you already know this stuff, okay? But I'm just going to come up and remind you of this. All right, and that's kind of what uh, that's kind of the idea of what Peter is doing here. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know and have been established in. Okay, and what I love about this, and we're going to get into this in just a little bit here, but I'll just point it out now: is just you you see the changed life of Peter. Um, and it really gives me a lot of hope because, I mean, hey, yeah, because I got a lot of changing to do too. And as you see the life of Peter in the Gospels, and then you see his attitude as it's here, as he's writing uh, this letter in Second Peter, hey, I, I mean, it's almost like a different man with a different heart. I mean, when in the Gospels, when in the Gospels you're reading about the life of Jesus and Peter's there, since when has he ever cared about other people's feelings? You know? Yeah. But he starts to hear a little bit, and you can kind of gather that a little bit. You, you know, I care about you, and I want this conversation to go well. So, but, let, but let's go back there to the beginning of the verse. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. And when Peter uses the word therefore, what he simply means is look back at, at, uh, uh, look back at what I just wrote down. Look back at what I just wrote down, and he says, the things that I just wrote to you about, I want you to know that I intend with every chance I have. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these things. Every chance I have, every chance I have, I intend to give you a reminder of these things. These things that I've already communicated with you about. What has he communicated with them about? Well, it's a couple of things. 
the first, the number one thing he's communicated with them about, communicated with them about, starting in verse number three, is just knowing God. I want you to know God. I want you to know your God and understand who He is. It's so important that you keep this close to your heart, this knowledge of who God is, and that you're seeking it out for yourself in His Word. Um, and the Word was very, very important to Peter. In fact, he talks about it in verse number 19 here of this passage. When he says, and we're not going to we'll look at this today, um, but he says, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. The word was important to Peter. And, and he says, we need to be pursuing knowing God and his word. And I'm going to remind you every chance I get who God is and what he has done for you. We need to know God. So Peter te- So Peter, first of all, tells us in the things God has done. Look with me in verse number three. And we're going to quickly walk through this and see what Peter is reminding his readers of. First Peter chapter one, look back at verse three. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Let me stop there for a second. Do you realize, here's what Peter is pointing out. Do we realize, do we understand, do we know this God? That he, that, that he by his power has given to us all things that pertain to life and to godliness. First of all, to life, eternal life. Do we understand that he has accomplished everything that we needed to have eternal life? Do we understand that? We did nothing for it. Yeah. We didn't deserve eternal life. We did not deserve a relationship with God. We sinned and fell short of the what? Glory of God. We deserve to be separated from him for all of eternity. He accomplished, he did absolutely everything that was needed for you and I to have eternal life. He came to this earth. He was born. He lived the perfect life, the sinless life that you and I could not live. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And then he died. The death that we should have died. But he took our place. And paid the penalty for our sins. He did it all. He did absolutely everything that was needed for you and I to receive eternal life. He did it. Peter says, Do you, and, and, and Peter's saying, I'm going to remind you of this. You need to understand this. You need to know this. You need to remember this. This is who your God is. This is the big God that you serve. This is our big God. Look what he has done for you. You need to know this. You need to understand this. This is who God is. He loves you. He loves you with all of his heart. Not only has he done everything that was necessary to give you eternal life, but his divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. In other words, do we understand that to live the life that God wants us to live, to live a life that looks like the life of Jesus, to look like Jesus, do we understand that we have no ability in and of ourselves to do that? God wants us to work at that, but we have no ability in and of ourselves to do that. We cannot do that on our own. For it is God who what in you? Works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Wow. Wow. Peter says, this is what you need to understand. This is what you need to know. You need to know your God. Know this and do not forget this. Do not forget this. I'm going to remind you of this. This is who your God is. He has provided this for you. He has done this for you. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his glory and excellence. Who called us to his own glory and excellence. Do you realize that when you came to know Christ as Savior, it was because he called you? Look at at this other thing that he's done for us. Peter says, understand this. Understand what your God has done for you. When you came to Christ to receive salvation, you did not come on your own accord. You came because he actually called you. Wow. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Unbelievable what God does for us. He called us. He revealed to us who he was. The Bible says that no man can come to the Father unless the Father what? 
draws him. Draws him. He drew us to himself. He revealed to us who he was. And we were attracted to that. And we came because he drew us. What a God we serve. He's the creator of all things. He's the all-powerful one. He is the all-knowing one. I know there's big words for this, but I don't exactly remember what they are, so I'm just writing them out. He is the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning of the end. He's everywhere at once. He revealed his moral excellence to us. He's patient. He's kind. He's gentle. He is faithful. He loves us. This is who our God is. When he revealed that to you, Peter says, that is what drew you into him. This is what God has done for you. You need to know this. I am going to remind you of this until the day I die. Because you must not forget who your God is. You must know him. You must know him. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. Do you realize that whenever you received him as your savior and became one of his children, he granted to you some precious and very great promises. What are some promises that accompany salvation? What are some promises that God has given to his children who have received him as salvation? Can somebody shout out a few of them? Sorry? Perfect peace. Good. What? I will never leave you nor forsake you. What? What? Home in heaven. There's another one. Eternal life. No one can snatch you out of my Father's hand. I will never throw you away once you have become one of mine. You're a child of the King. He's, how about forgiveness of sins? Wow. Peter says, you need to remember this. I am reminding you of this, and I will never, ever stop reminding you of this until the day I die. You need to understand who your God is. You need to know who your God is. You need to know God. You need to be in this word. Where do we find all this stuff? Where do we find all this stuff about God? In his word. Are you in the word of God? Do people understand who God is because you are in the word, learning who God is, knowing your God fuller and more deeply every day, and, and, and because of that, it spews out of your heart. People who you are around, do they know God better because you are there? He's given us so much. So that through them, you may become partakers of the divine nature. Let me just, as I've done a study on that, as I've done a study on that phrase. When we accepted Christ as our Savior and He forgave us of our sins, He made us His very children. He adopted you and I into His family. We are actually family to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. To God. And, and he says, I made you my very heir. You are the heir. I am the heir of God. Peter says, never forget this. I am going to remind you of this. I have every intention of reminding you of this every chance I get until I am no longer here. I have every intention of telling you about this, reminding you of this. This is who our God is. Look what he has done for you. Look what he has accomplished for you. This is God. And then he takes a shift, starting in verse number 5. And he tells us that now that, you, and now that you, God has done all of these things for you, in other words, verse number 5, for this very reason, in other words, because God has done all of this for you, here is the correct, correct reaction from you and I now. The correct reaction is that we now walk in obedience to our God. This is the correct reaction. Because he has done all this, now you walk in obedience to him. And Peter goes over this obedient life. It's not an exhaustive list, but it's many things that, in, that are involved in the obedient life towards the Lord. Verses 5 through 7. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. And virtue with knowledge. And by the way, virtue right there is the excellence of becoming like Christ. A lot of things involved in that word there. And virtue with knowledge. 
and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness. Godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. If this is the obedient life. Peter says, I'm never going to stop reminding you of this. You need to understand the kind of person that God wants you to be. You need to know God and know the kind of person that he wants you to be. It's all here. It's all here. Do we know it? Do we know it? And then lastly, Peter tells us that when we choose to do this, when we choose to know God and choose to obey Him, here's what we can expect then in verses 8 through 11. We will bear fruit. We'll have assurance of our salvation because we'll see God, the Holy Spirit, working in our life and growing us. Evidence of our salvation. And look forward to a rich entrance into the eternal kingdom. Read with me verses 8 through 11. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing... They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the person who knows God and walks in obedience. Not perfectly, but like Paul says, I strive towards the mark. I strive or I work at this because of what God has done for me. Peter says, here's my reminder. And I will do this until the day I die. And that day is coming soon. But until I die, I will continue to remind you of these character qualities of Jesus Christ. That he wants you to walk in. And he wants me to walk in. Do we know him? Do we know him? And does that knowledge overflow from us. Into the people that we're around. Do people know God just a little bit better. Because God has placed you in their life. Are we good at giving out these reminders to one another? And to the people that we're close with. And point number two, it gets a little interesting. Yeah, let's go to verse number 13. Bible says, I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder. Point number two, it's right that Peter reminds people to know and obey God. It's right. Peter says this is the right thing for me to do. I'm at the end of my life. I know the day is coming soon when I will depart. And this is the right thing for me to do. Now, let me ask us something. Do we ever get tired of being reminded of stuff? Especially stuff we already know. Does that ever grow weary to you? It does to me. My mother used to, because believe it or not, I get irritated at my mom whenever I was young. Um, and because she would remind me of stuff. Stuff that I already knew. Not that I was doing it or anything. But it was stuff that I already knew. And she would say something like this to me. She, she would go, Aaron, I will remind you of this. Until you will never, ever, ever forget it. Okay, I will remind you to take out the trash until you will, like, until you will dream about taking out the trash. Okay? I will always do this. And you know, what's funny, and, and a funny thought that hit me is, Peter, Peter is actually backing my mom up here. <laughs> Which is something new, because me and my brothers never back my mom up, like, ever. <laughs> Not that we shouldn't have. Peter is saying that this is right for me to do this. Okay? Don't get irritated with this. Don't get irritated at me. I know you already know this stuff, but this is right for me to do. Because you must keep this close to your heart. You must keep this close. You must not forget this. And, and 
And he goes on in verse number 13, I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder. And by the way, whenever he says stir up, what that literally means in the Greek is to awaken out of drowsiness. Or to awaken into stimulant thinking. Let me ask you something. How, how busy are we in, in, um, in, in the culture that we live in? How busy are we? Say it again. Busy, 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 right? I mean, we got stuff going on like crazy. I hear some of you talking about it all the time, and you're right. We live in an extremely busy culture. Let me ask you something. Is it possible in our busyness with all the responsibilities that we got going on, can we sometimes become drowsy to some of these things? Absolutely. If you're anything like me, maybe some of you are not, maybe most of you are not, you probably don't want to admit if you are, but if you're anything like me at all, yes. We can become extremely drowsy to these things. And let our responsibilities push out to where we don't think about this, to where we don't, and, 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 and it gets to the point where we don't remember these things. We don't remember who our God is. That He loves us. That He has done everything for us to give us salvation. Look at what He has accomplished. That He drew us to Himself. He did this for us. All these things. We start to not know Him as well. How many times during the week does our busyness push out our personal time with God? We need to know Him. We need to be in here knowing Him more fully every day. We must never forget this. And Peter says, I'm not going to be around and, and when I leave you behind, I want to see you knowing God and obeying God. I'm going to tell you what this life needs to look like. I'm going to encourage you in this. Do we encourage each other in this? I want to look just for a moment at Peter's humble attitude. Look for with me just for a moment at Peter's humble attitude because this is amazing. Look at the changed life of Peter as he now is doing what he's doing compared to what he used to do. This is so encouraging to me. Whenever, look, look, look up there at verse number one, just, just, just in the way he, just in the way he um, introduces himself. I mean, he literally introduces himself as the servant of Jesus Christ. And by the way, the word he uses there for servant is slave. I'm literally a slave of Jesus Christ. In other words, I am totally 100% committed to my master who owns me. He has every right to tell me what to do. He has every right to tell me where to go and how to get there. He, he's got every right over me. This is who I am. I am the servant of Jesus Christ. What a submissive man. And then we come down to, and, and, and then just the next phrase, um, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. He puts that right into practice, that attitude. When Jesus commissioned him to go, when Jesus personally commissioned him to go and make disciples and preach the good news, he knew where his place was and he said, yes, sir, I will go. I will do this because I'm the servant of Jesus Christ. You see a huge change in Peter at that moment and as he writes this letter to the man that maybe he used to be. Back in the Gospels, remember back in Matthew, yeah, Matthew chapter 16, remember Matthew chapter 16, where he's really not taking orders from Jesus, he's kind of taking him aside and telling Jesus what to do, I mean, you remember that? He's rebuking him, I mean, I like to think I have guts and stuff, but that's, that, that, that's a gutsy move right there, I mean, I don't teach, I, I mean, I don't do that to my own mother, because if I would, I'd probably be wearing my teeth right around my neck, if you know what I'm saying. Boy, I'm talking about my mother a lot today, aren't I? It's probably not a good thing. She doesn't know how to use a computer, so she'll probably never see this, which is good. Um, please don't tell my mother I said these things. Um, <laughs> I 
But we see, we, but, but you, can see, you can start to see the changed life of Peter. In Matthew, no, Mark chapter 14, remember when, when Jesus needed someone the very most, when he needed a friend in the worst kind of a way at that point, what did Peter do? Denied him. Probably because he feared for his own life. And then Peter commissions him later on. Peter commissions him. Remember that conversation that Jesus and Peter had? Where, Peter, it, where, where Jesus, after he had resurrected, sat down with Peter and said, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. And you know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Making disciples. Then he doesn't stop. Now here is where the rubber meets the road. Jesus then goes on and he actually tells Peter. Now think about this. Think of the ramifications to this. He actually tells Peter, by the way, Peter, thank you for saying yes to me. Here's something else that I'm going to reveal to you. This is going to cost you everything. And in the end, the Bible says, when you're old, you will be led to a place where you do not want to go. And your hands will be stretched out. And the Bible says that he said this to reveal to Peter in what manner he was going to die. Peter was going to be crucified for the cause of Christ like our Lord was. Now what I want us to take special notice of is Peter knew that the time was coming. How did Peter know? I don't know. It, it, it doesn't really say. Yeah. But what I want to draw our attention to here as we start to close is what Peter decides to do with these final days of his life. Somehow, Peter knew the time was drawing close. He doesn't have a pity party. He doesn't say, poor me, why me? Doesn't do anything like that. He says... I'm going to make this decision. I have one more gift to give. And I am going to teach people who Jesus is, who God is. My influence, I want to help people know God and to walk with God in obedience. That was his decision. Is that our decision? You know, I was raised in a home where I was, taught, I was taught unconditional respect to people that were older than me. I was taught you don't question them, you don't talk back to them, you be quiet, and you sit and you listen to people who are older than you. That's how I grew up. And that was a good way to grow up. That was a really good way to grow up. I want to respectfully, and, and I want to do this according to the book of Timothy. I want to respectfully, though, talk to people who are older than me and maybe have some gray hairs for a moment. Probably, not necessarily, but probably you are nearer this day that Peter was near to than some of us other young whippersnappers, okay? Okay. You're probably nearer that day. Not necessarily. Not necessarily at all, but probably. Let me, I want to respectfully encourage you and say, will you please not stop? You have gray hair. The Bible says that it's a crown for you. It's wisdom for you to give. It represents wisdom that you can give. Will you please not lose heart and will you please not stop? Until the day comes when 
God says it's time for you to depart. Will you have the heart of Simon Peter and say, I will not stop teaching people about who God is and I will not stop encouraging people to walk in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. People will, because I am there, know who God is a little bit better. I have wisdom to give. God wants me to give it and I will give it. That's my encouragement to you, please. Why? Why would I encourage that? Why would Peter encourage that? Our final point tonight. Point number four. Look at verse number 15. Here's the whole message of verse number 15. Because I don't want you to need me. Now how about that for humility? Because I don't want you to need me. I don't want to be needed anymore. When I depart, I don't want you to need me. Verse number 15, and I will make every effort. In other words, I will work hard at this. I will make every effort to do this for you, to remind you of these things. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. I don't want you to have to need me. I, it's, it's not me that I want you to remember whenever I'm not here anymore. It's what I have given to you. It's the word that I have given to you. You know, I can't come up with anything clever that's going to help people know God better. The only thing that I can give that's going to be worth anything is his word. The only thing you can give that's going to be worth anything is his word. We know God through his word. Peter says, I don't want you to need me. I want to give you the word so that whenever I depart, you do not need me. And you're walking with God on your own. You're knowing God on your own. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. As parents, this should be our goal with our children. That we are giving them the word. That we are teaching them the knowledge of God. So that they, ha so, so that they have a much better opportunity. So that we can be used as tools in God's hand to share the gospel that they may become children of God and receive it and then teach them who their God is so that they can, become, so, so that they can know God better because we are their parents, because we're there. And then, but, 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 but we want the day to come whenever we say, hey, you understand this. You don't need me. You have God. You have his word. You know what it says. You have an understanding. You need to keep in it. Just like dad needs to keep in it. You need to keep in it. You need to keep walking closely with him. But you know. Now go. You don't need me. And when I depart from this world, you're okay. You're okay. That's our heart for our children. That's the heart that Peter had for his readers. Whenever I'm not here anymore, the day is coming soon, I'm not going to be here. I want you to be okay. So I'm going to do this for you. Till the day I die. I'm going to instill this in you. You know, I would appreciate your prayers for me and my wife as we're in the middle of this endeavor right here. Trent, no, you cannot hit your sister. Why? Because God wants us to be kind. Share the word. Because God wants us to be kind, that's why. And he wants us to love, to love each other. And when you hit her, that's not kind. And that's not loving. Okay? We need to do what God says. We need to obey him. He gave everything for us, we can do that. Or, Trent, you waited so patiently for your turn. You didn't throw a fit. You, you, you didn't go crazy. You didn't throw yourself on the ground. You stood there very patiently. Man, that is awesome. Good job. That's exactly how God wants us to be. He wants us to be patient. That's one of the things He wants us to be. Instilling these things into our children. When I'm gone... May I have had an influence on my children and they don't need me because they're walking with God. They know God. They obey Him. 
and maybe they know him just a little better because I was in their life. That's what Peter's saying. What a challenge. Do you think about the truth that one day you're going to die? Say, wow, it's kind of cutting right to it. Thanks for a great encouraging sermon this morning. But I'll tell you what, we would do well to do what Simon Peter did and think on that. Because that day is coming for everybody. Hebrews 9.27, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. That day is coming. It's coming for me. I'm 30, I know I'm not. I'm almost 32 years old. We'll be in a couple of weeks. My time could be soon. Are the people in my life, do they know God just a little better? Do they know the kind of person God wants them to be just a little better? Because God placed me in their life. What do you think? The people that are in your life, because God placed you in their life, do they know God? Do they obey God just a little bit more than they would had you not been in their life? Till the day we die as a church family, may we forever remind each other of these truths of our God, encourage one another to obey God, and encourage the people that we know that are around us to know God and to walk in His way. That's the message. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Will you bow with me as we close in prayer today? Dear kind Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you for your word. Thank you for what it teaches us, Father, that it's a, light un it, 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 that it's a lamp under our feet and a light to our pathway. Father, in your word is where you reveal yourself to us. It's where we come to know you. To know you as our Savior and to know you on a deeper level as we pursue our relationship with you. Father, I just want to ask for each one that's in here this morning and myself that as we look at these words of Peter and see Peter's heart, thank you for writing this down for us. Father, may we together never cease to take Peter's example and to remind each other how important it is that we know God, that we spend time with you in your word, getting to know you, learning the kind of person that you want us to be, and that we may walk with you. I just want to ask, as the instruments start to play, I just want to ask one question. Is there anyone in here who would say, man, you know, you've talked a lot about God today. You've talked a lot about knowing Him. And you know, I don't know that I know this God that you're talking about. But I would sure like to. Boy, I've, I, boy, I've seen how big He is this morning. I've, I've just seen a glimpse, I guess, of how big He is this morning. I've started to come to an understanding of who He is and what He's done. I'd like to be introduced to this God that has done so much for me. I just want to say, I just want to say, if that's you this morning, would you just lift your hand up? Say, yeah, that's me. Thank you very much. Maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking this, man, man, you know something? I realize today the kind of life God wants me to live. I realize that he wants me to be knowing Him in His Word and letting that overflow in my heart into the lives of other people. I don't know that I've been doing that the way God wants me to. I just want to ask, Pastor, would you pray for me? Would you pray for me this morning? Would you lift your hand up? No one's looking around. Would you pray for me? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me put your hands down. 
As the instrument plays, I'll just pray. If you'd like to come forward and talk to someone, there's counselors here. Make things right with the Lord. Be encouraged in that. Let me pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you so much for those that have raised their hands, have responded to you. Father, would you draw near to them and let them see where they need to make things right with you and now move forward with you as they reach into other people's lives with your word, with the knowledge of who you are. Father, guide them, guide us all as we continue to walk with you. We love you, Lord. And Father, we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus.